Good morning. Man, it's raining and cold outside. Can I be honest with you? This morning, is around 6.30, I walk into the kitchen. Our daughter-in-law and our son are living with us right now. It was amazing. And I ran into Megan. And uh, I was like, all right, Megan, real, real talk. If there was ever a day to skip church, this would have been the one, man. It was rainy. It was cold. And I could already hear the debate in your minds and hearts. Hi, everybody on Facebook that didn't come to church because you were too cozy. We see you. We're so glad to have you join us online. And obviously, all the people that really love the Lord here. And no, I'm just kidding. It's uh, being, I'm sassy today, y'all. It's been a couple of weeks. Actually, I took some time off. I'm so glad to be back in the saddle to bring the Word of God with you guys. But can we just honor Pastor Ramin and Pastor Charles for bringing the Word? The last couple of weeks is so good. We love you guys. Oh, my gosh. Uh, let me tell you, don't ever get used to having good pastors on staff. Um, God has assembled an amazing team that I trust, I love. I have existing and prior relationship with all of them, and it's just a real pleasure to serve with our pastors. And so God is so good. So happy 2021. Happy 2021. I, I got to be honest. How come it seemed more fun to say it about a week ago than it does today? Let's just, let's just be honest for a second. I mean, we're already seeing folks saying on social media, 2021 is just basically 2020, the sequel, you know? Um, I was actually getting my car washed last week, and I'm standing there waiting for it to get done, and I heard these two guys uh, talking about 2021. This is true. This is so true. And they were saying basically, well, you know, they're talking about all the nonsense as it was already happening in our world in the first six days of the year. And the guy said, I swear, this is a quote, he's like, well, I guess we just got to wrap it up and try again in 2022. And I'm like, dude, we're only six days into the new year, and we're like, well... There goes that, CN 2022. I don't think this is God's plan for us. To throw in the towel six days in, or in this case, 10 days in, and go, ah, never mind. We'll just be apathetic another year, and we'll figure it out next year when we feel a little bit more spiritual and our circumstances become more favorable. I don't think that's what God wants. Uh, actually, there's a Grace Pointer who posted this, and I did think this was funny. Um, she posted this online on Facebook. She said, I'd like to cancel my subscription to 2021. I've experienced the free seven-day trial, and I'm not interested. Maybe you can relate to that. I could totally get that. But here's the thing. Let's be honest. 2020, part, I would say even a large part of what made it whatever it was for us is it took us off guard, didn't it? Like, we were, we were in our zone, and, I, and here's the thing. We need to be careful, because I ministered to a lot of y'all in 2019. You're like, David, my life's terrible. I wish my life would change. God, would you bring a breakthrough? Would you change my life? And he does. There's this major disruption that takes place. We go, I wish I could go back to my normal, terrible life, right? Why do we do that? Because we love comfort. We love predictability. This is why we stay in toxic relationships longer than we should. It's because even though we don't like it, it's predictable. We know what we're getting. There's patterns of behavior in our lives that we get into, and we don't want to break out of it. We know it's destructive, but we know how to live within those things. And then we're like, God, change my life. Bring a new thing. Lord, he's doing a new thing, right? And then all of a sudden, he starts doing a new thing in our lives. And we're like, hold on, the things that I trusted and grabbed for, or, you know, even lights working on the stage and all sorts of stuff going out, you just got to roll with it, right? I don't know if it ever turned back on, but I just aged 10 years. There you go. That's, that takes the 10 years off my face. Um, but here's the point. The point is this. What is my point? My point is there's some PTSD, so anything in 2021 that smells or even looks like it possibly could be a repeat of 2020, we freak out and we flinch. I get it. For me, it was like having a bucket of cold water thrown on top of me in the middle of the night. And maybe that was the case for you too. And so the idea that, oh no, not another. What do we do? What do we do as Christ followers? Isn't it great to hear the rain, by the way? I, I really felt when I heard it this morning, the Lord reminded me of the fact that the rain is blessing. It, it, in Scripture, the rain was a symbol of God's grace and blessing. And isn't it cool, as we open up the series called The One Thing, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, that God gives us rain. Each and every service, this last service came in at the same time. God, you're so good. But let's talk about 2020 really quickly, because the things that we ran for wisdom, we ran to for wisdom, 
comfort, the things that we trusted in to help us cope that we've learned over 2020 failed us. I'm happy to tell you that regardless of how your year has started, the beautiful thing is this year, we don't have to be taken off guard like we were last year, right? And that affords us, that understanding affords us the ability to actually have some do-overs. We can actually live differently in 2021, even if things don't change. And I really do believe this, because we are able to position ourselves the right way, understanding we're living in a chaotic time, the reality is this, whatever battles or blessings that we will experience, because they both happen at the same time very often, we're going to be positioned to be able to see them for what they are and not allow our circumstances to tell us how much we can trust in God or how much hope we can have for tomorrow. He is our future. Jesus is still on the throne, all by himself, by the way. He's got this, and he's got you, and he's got me. And I'm not saying we're not going to walk through hard times. It may be even twice as bad this year. I don't know. But what would you say if I told you we can navigate the uncertainty of life at the same time while still getting to live in certainty? That is what the Lord wants to give us in 2021. He's not promising, promising us a smooth road, although that may happen. But I think instead of a smooth road, because I think we've idolized the smooth road too much. I think we've made an idol out of normal. Because I, including me, I was just saying along with the rest of the world, I just want to get back to, say it with me, normal. But I don't think that's God's best for us. Because I think he says, no, I actually, I want you to get back to my heart. Get back to my heart. Normal is normal. You weren't made for normal. You're not normal. I'm not normal. You're like, amen, brother. That's the first truth we've heard this morning. Amen. So over the holidays, I took some time off, and um, I was just seeking God's heart for this congregation. Um, I was just sharing with, I've just shared with anybody that, I'll, that I can talk to, but I talk about how much I love you guys. And if you're new here, you are loved. Um, seriously, it is an honor to be your pastor. I've been here for about 18 months. Wouldn't want to be any at any other church on planet Earth than this one right here with you guys. I love my people, man. And I just want you to know that. And my love is growing, but I also feel a, re a very deep, sobering responsibility to really seek God, to know how to properly pastor and lead this congregation to all that God has for you and his best. I don't want to just come up here and mail some stuff in and just keep the flywheel going. I want to see God do what he says he wants to do in your life. And so I want to be able to pastor you well. So it just requires me to go to God and go, God, what do you want to do? And as I was fasting and praying and seeking the Lord, one of the big things that he told me for 2021, our focus is going to come back to one thing. And so this morning, Grace Point West is launching the One Thing Initiative, okay? Now, what is the one thing? Well, the one thing has a lot of different expressions, okay? But the focus is singular. What is the focus? The one thing that we are talking about is the Good Shepherd. The one thing is our anchor, our hope, our salvation, our victory, our way forward, the way through the narrow gate, Jesus Christ. He is the one thing. And I really do believe that 2020, starting with me, just proved how difficult it can be to put your focus on the one thing. Right? I mean, there was real, I mean, you know, y'all know some of the stuff that we went through, and, and, and I know some of the stuff y'all went through. It was super hard to focus on what, the one thing last year when everything seemed to be unraveling in our lives. But you know what? The thing that I noticed that I think really kind of served our, our inability to keep our, our, our focus on the one thing was everyone was talking last year. Everybody had an opinion, right? Everybody had something to say about everything. And when you have 7 billion people on the planet going, uh, excuse me, I think, right? And then they start talking about what they think and what we think and what... I, I think it's all of a sudden, it's just it's so, who do you listen to? And when everyone is talking, no one can listen. I think last year, we were just trying to make sense, and it would make, it's, it's very credible to be able to go, okay, well, let's listen to some smart people. Maybe the smart people can show us the way through this thing. And we should be paying attention to those folks. So what we did is we turned on our TVs. Remember noon every day in March, April, and May? 
We're there with our popcorn or our haagen because we're quarantined and we're sitting on a stack of toilet paper that we hoarded. Remember? Remember? And we're sitting there on our toilet paper thrones and well, that's, that's a weird picture, but you get the idea. I'm not, and we're just sitting there and we're like, Dr. Fauci's got the answer, right? So we listen to the doctors, we listen to the politicians, we listen to the commentators, right? We listen to the news outlets, we listen to the social media outlets and influencers. We also listen to shame and guilt and regret show up and all of these voices are talking all at the same time. And the smartest and the best that the world had to offer has left us where we are today. I'm not saying people aren't trying and I'm not saying we're not making progress. This is not a, my point is this. I think if we learned anything, we've heard a lot of people talk. And we've done a lot of talking. And I think 2021 is the year to listen. It's time to start listening. I think we have to just, I I quoted Dr. Evil uh, in the first sermon, and I feel it's very spiritual to do that again. But does anybody remember uh, the, you know, Austin Powers, right? Like the 25-year-old movie reference. I'm right on the cutting edge of culture. Uh, But Dr. Evil, he's got this little snotty-nosed kid, this red-headed stepchild boy, and he's sitting there, and Dr. Evil's like, shh. But But you don't understand. Shh. He's like, I've got a whole bag of shh right over here with your name all over it. But dad, you don't understand. Shh. And I think God is going, I've got a whole bag of shh right here. And I'm like, but, but God, you don't understand. This, this party is doing this. And these people, these politicians, shh, 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 shh. It's time for God to talk a little bit. Because maybe he's got something to say. And wouldn't it just be a kicker if he actually had the answer? Whoa, you mean God could have, you, so let's see. Let's, let's dig into this a little bit further. I feel that 2020 was like going to a restaurant on the river walk on the weekend, okay? Now, this is a good thing, all right? But when you're in a party, festive mood, just think about Fiesta. Remember when we used to do that? Um, Remember those times and night in old San Antonio, Neosa, or it's Niosa, not Neosa, okay? But here's the thing. You're in a restaurant. The dishes are clinging. The music is blaring, right? People are laughing. There's a football game on the big screen, and people are yelling and cheering. And and, and, then just to be able to give your order, it's like, I want a Diet Coke. The waitress, huh? I want a Diet Coke. Got it, right? That environment is exciting, and it's like, ah. But you can't stay there forever. Because if you stay there too long in that type of environment, you start getting a little homicidal. Right? You're like, I got to get out of here. I got to get some peace and quiet, man. At least for me, now that I'm almost 50, I'm like, I need peace and quiet, man. But here's the thing. In those environments, it's hard to have an intimate conversation, isn't it? Like, you wouldn't take someone to that environment on a first date and just say, you know, with all this chaos going around and people yelling out their orders and plates and blah, 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 and go, so tell me a little bit more about yourself. (laughs) Well... I love to write poetry. I like long walks on the beach or whatever it may be, right? Um, You would go to a restaurant where they don't even have the lights on. You would have candles on the table. And it's just one, it's like a two-person table and you sit down and you're able to focus on one person and listen to what they say. There's this intimate exchange that that other environment where everyone's yelling and banging plates and acting like fools, you can't really have that. Scripture talks about how God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And this is kind of how I'm seeing this table in my own life where God is saying, I know there's chaos around you. I know that there's people that want to kill you. I know that there's disease that are chasing after you and is harming people. I understand these are our enemies. But he says, hey, I want to sit down with you. And I want to have a conversation. But I think if God was really going to say, hey, after lunch, you would just you and me, I don't think we would be so dumb as to sit down at the table and go, okay, God, I got some things I need to talk about here. I got a lot of important things to say. Do you think we would do that? No, we would be like, oh, my gosh, I'm at the table with the Lord. Maybe I should just let him do some talking. He may have something to say. Here's the thing. My point is, is I believe God in his grace in 2021, in his providence because he loves you. God still loves you. God will love you tomorrow and he loved you yesterday. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is consistent. He is gracious. He is good. And he is a God that invites. 
He is an invitational God. He's not an oppositional God. He won't stiff arm you. He longs for relationship and intimacy with his people. He longs for it. Scripture says that he is jealous for you. He's jealous for you. And so in the setting, if you just imagine sitting at the table in this quiet, intimate setting, the whisper of God's voice can show up. Scripture talks about this is how the Lord many times will speak. It's in the gentle whisper. And the only way for you to hear a whisper is to lean in and you can't talk. And God wants to whisper truth, direction, understanding. He wants to be able to whisper over the chaos of your life, peace be still. And I believe that there's a joy that he's wanting to recreate and produce out of your weakness. I believe that there is going to be peace he wants to restore and reestablish in your life. And I believe that God is wanting to show his children the pathway forward. But there's no way we can have these things take place if we're a part of the other 7 billion on the planet just yelling, yelling, yelling their opinions. Enough with the opinions. And I believe he's wanting to give us something in 2021, new mercies that he promises to give us each and every morning so that we can get up out of bed regardless of our circumstances. And I understand the weight of what I'm trying to say, but I'm telling you the word of God says that this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And if that is something we could stand on, there's a way to be able to walk in that in spite of the doctor's report, in spite of the negative checking account balance, in spite of that whatever it may be we face. He's saying you can walk in joy. I've made this day for you and I will give you your daily bread. That's what he says. But you want to know what comes before the daily bread? We pray, dear Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven in my life. Then that positions me to sit at the table, hear from God, and be fed by God the daily bread. Daily bread, not weekly bread. And some of y'all, you're starved spiritually because you're only getting fed one hour a week. That's not the way to eat. Our God is not a stingy God. He wants us to gorge ourselves on his word. He wants to feed us. Recently, I was sitting down with one of my old leadership mentors, Robert Vogel, who I love, and it was so good to see him, and he's probably watching right now, so Robert, I love you, but we were sitting there having breakfast, and one of the things that he said struck me, he said, David, as spiritual leaders, one of the most important things we can do is to teach the people that we lead how to hear from God, and I said, Robert, I'm letting you know, I'm plagiarizing all of that, and I'm stealing that statement, and I'm putting it in my sermon, and I'm honoring my word to do that, because it's true. Because here's the problem. If I don't teach you and if the pastors on the staff don't disciple you in how to hear from God, do you know what's going to happen? We're going to grow an audience instead of growing disciples. I have no interest in growing an audience. My ego doesn't need it, but I want to see God do in your life what he's doing in mine. And here's the thing. I don't have a special extra hookup to God where I get the extra good stuff back over here that he, no. As a matter of fact, I'm just right in it with you. And there's days where I am not spiritual. There's days that I say bad words in my head. Anybody else in here going to jump on that train with me? All right, nasty mouth, potty mouth. No, right? We judge people. Ooh, sometimes I'm just like, Lord, why did I think that? What's wrong with me? I'm just trying to figure this out right along with everybody else and hear the voice of God and act like a Christian because I want to be able to walk in the better that God has for me. But it's a struggle sometimes. But my point is this. As we take greater steps into 2021, into deeper understanding of what uncommon life in Jesus really looks like, more than ever in our lifetime, this is what I'm trying to say. I believe that God's voice in 2021 needs to be the voice that we hear the most clearly, the one that is the most loudest, and the one that we trust the most. Sean Hannity nor Don Lemon have anything on God. Ooh, I know I shouldn't have said that, but it's true, guys. Man, I swear we put so much stock in these folks. And why? What if God said, why don't you consult me? Scripture says that those who inquire of the Lord, he will show them the way in which they should go. Are we inquiring of the Lord? 
Or is our daily bread coming from a network or a social media feed? Or that uncle you don't even like anyway on Facebook? And you're like, that's your daily, no! I think what we need, what God is calling us as I was hiking and praying and really considering what the Lord wants to do in 2021, I really do believe this. I think that this is the year that we recapture childlike faith that Jesus talks about. He says, it's these kids. If you want to know what the kingdom of God looks like, it's these little knuckleheads because they have a pure faith. And we take on the position of Samuel, who was a little boy living in the temple of God, where he wakes up in the middle of the night. Someone is calling out his name, Samuel, Samuel. He didn't recognize the voice. But after the third time, he goes, oh my gosh, this is God talking to me. And I think for us in 2021, we are going to have to learn to discern the voice of God. And you may not recognize it, but you keep listening. And then the third time he goes, oh, this is God talking. And this is what he responds by saying, speak, Lord, for your servant is talking. Is that what it says? Is that, what that story, how that story goes? No, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, listening. And so the prayer that God put on my heart for 2021 for Grace Point West is this, Lord, teach us to listen and help us to hear and trust and obey what you're telling us to do, what you're saying. There's a difference between coming and having a confirmation bias here on a Sunday morning going, keep preaching, that's right, that's right, that's a good word, amen, amen. But then scripture talks about those who are under that type of teaching and then they leave. It's like looking in the mirror and walking away and forgetting what you look like. It's when you put it into practice, you begin to see things shift in your life. Your perspective, your capacity to love the unlovable, your ability to cross across lines that typically you would not interact with those types of people. Those people who act this way, vote this way, smell this way, whatever this way. All of a sudden, you begin to remember more often when you mess up, you go, no, the righteous may stumble six times, but they get up every single time. Right? Instead of going, oh, I'm a terrible Christian. You see, when we allow our obedience to be the North Star, it leads to the heart of God. Jesus was obedient to death on a cross. For what purpose? Because he knew that's the way to the Father's heart is obedience. It opens up and not only blesses you, but those around you. We are called to be the light of the world. And so we can, any dog can, or with a note can t- go, go to the group of people and go, and you're living in darkness. Wow, Captain Obvious, that's amazing. But you have the light. I've got the light. We are the light of the world. Are we bringing this light? I think we're hoarding it or we don't even realize we have it within us. And God is wanting to reveal this to us, y'all. And so when we begin to listen to God and we allow him to define our walk in 2021, we are able to tune our ears to his voice. All of a sudden, we're listening to one voice operating as one body unified in one direction, following one leader, one shepherd, Jesus Christ, the one thing initiative. That's why we're doing this. You see, David actually has some experience with this understanding of what it means to focus on the one thing. This is what he says. Now, listen, David is having his own personal 2020 in this chapter, King David. He, he's being surrounded by enemies. They're threatening him. They're gonna, they want to rip him limb to limb. And this is what he says. Y'all ready? Check this out. The Lord is my light and my salvation. If that's true, David is going through a process of deduction. He's going, okay, if this is true, then why should I honestly be afraid? If God is truly our light and our salvation this morning, we are allowed to ask the question, then why in the world am I freaking out? The Lord is my fortress. He protects me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and they will fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will still even remain confident even then that God is my refuge, he's my strength, and he is my protector. And listen to what he says, verse 4. You ready? He goes, in spite of all that, The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing that I seek the most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. 
delighting in the Lord's perfections and slowing down to meditate in his temple. This word where it says in Hebrew, house is yasab, which means the word, the way that he's using this word is actually the same idea as a husband and a wife in a married covenant relationship living together and sharing everything in intimacy cohabitating in the same house. So when he says within the house, he's saying, I want to be so close to God that it's like I'm married in that way, that I have intimacy. So when he whispers, I can hear it. I'm close by. This is David writing this inspired by the Holy Spirit, but this is pre-crucifixion and, and resurrection. Scripture says that now we don't have to come into a building to experience the presence of God and meditate in his presence. Scripture says when you exchange your life for the life of Jesus, his presence lives within us. We become temples of God. So this means you can meditate in the temple, in traffic, in your car, in the closet, in the quiet place, when you're cutting up zucchini in the kitchen, wherever this is, the presence of God lives within you. The holy presence, resurrection power of God lives within you. And it says, and because of this knowledge, to know that I'm in God's hands. I'm not in 2021's hands. I'm in God's hands. He will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. And then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. And at his sanctuary, I'm going to do some stuff. He's saying, if I'm going to be in the presence of God, here's how I'm going to act. I'm going to offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I'm going to sing songs to you. If I get to be in your presence and you don't cast me out because of my, you've given me righteousness, then I'm going to sing my face off. I'm going to sing music. I'm going to talk about how awesome you are. I'm going to hang out with you because this one thing, I'm focused on this one thing, and that is to be in your presence. But not only just be in your presence, know that I am in your presence. Hear me as I pray, O Lord. He says, hear me. Please be merciful to me and answer me. He says, my heart has heard you say. Now, here we go. My heart has heard you say, God, come and talk with me. The word for heart is leb in Hebrew. And this word means my, the, the seat of my mind and my emotions has heard the invitation to come and talk with you. That's what the word heart here means. The seat of your emotions and your thoughts. Come and talk with me. And, it, and look at the response. Lord, I'm on my way. Lord, I am coming. This is not just for David. You understand. And I feel so strongly this morning. This isn't even really a sermon. It's, it's just me sharing where my, my heart is at and where I know the Lord is wanting us to go. God is extending an invitation to you this morning in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, listen. He's saying, come talk with me. And now you have the opportunity to respond back by saying, Lord, I'm going to come. I'm on my way. I'm, 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 I'm there. That is where we need to go. I don't think for the life of a Christian in 2021, I don't think a lot of people are going to be coming up to me going, I'm not hearing God talk. He's not saying anything to me. I think the, the, it's going to be the opposite. I believe God's sons and daughters are going to hear so much from God as they pursue the one thing in their life, which is Jesus, that they're going to go, I can't keep track of everything he's saying to me. I, I, I'm try, I, my journals are full of stuff that he's talking to me about, about what I need to be doing next and how I need to be living a, a greater holy life, all the things that he wants to share with you. But today is the day that we take this invitation seriously. And, I, and this is a very time-sensitive thing that the Lord is presenting to us this morning. And I feel a great depth of urgency, and I think you're starting to feel it in your own spirits, aren't you? You're sensing that, okay, this is different. There's something happening here. I believe that God not only wants to speak to you personally, but I believe that he is also going to speak corporately as we all seek together as one body focused on one thing. God is going to begin to speak to the church, capital C church across the globe, about how we need to align and respond and move forward. 
Because when you look at the, the, the scriptures, whether it's the New Testament or the Old Testament, when we see God's people making a conscious decision to make Jesus yet again the one thing in their life, not one plus another hundred, but Jesus is the sole focus. When they see, we see them consecrating themselves, meaning they set themselves apart for specific purposes for God's glory, times of fasting, times of prayer, times of intercession, times of worship, times with opening up the world making the sacrifice to do this, to sit at the table and allow God to speak and feed our hearts, something happens. God will never not react to that when his sons and daughters make this decision to make him their sole pursuit. Scripture says, Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and all of the other things in your life matter to me and they'll be added unto you. But those aren't the point. They're only reflections to God's goodness in your life. Quit worshiping the blessings and chasing blessings of normal. God says, I have more for my people. But it requires us to look at the one thing. Did you know, I just heard this this morning, did you know that the average person touches their cell phone over 2,000 times a day? Uh-huh. I'm just simply saying, we become what we behold. What if we took those 2,000 and made them one? How would we live differently? How, I, I, listen, this is not a sermon against cell phones. I'm just simply saying, I wonder though. What we see is that when God's people begin to pursue the one thing, not only were they realigned or aligned, whether it was a Gentile city like Nineveh, wicked, wicked Nineveh, they turned their hearts, or the God's people, Jerusalem, but often what this collective pursuit, like us in this room, making this decision to make God the one thing, what would happen is battles that seemed where they were like, we're overcome by, by defeat. When they begin to turn their hearts to the one thing, many times we would see the battles turn around and they would become overcomers instead of overcome. We see this in scripture proven. In Esther's case, if you don't know her story, genocide was about to take place. There was a law put in place that every single Jew was to be executed on a certain day. Esther, the sweet young girl, says, okay, you know what? There's no way we can reverse this law. I have no authority to do that, but I do know who does. We're going to fast and we're going to pray for three days as a group of people. And we're going to petition the throne of God. And we're going to ask him to reverse this impossibility. What happens? The very one who instigated the law was actually the one who suffered and died. He was the one executed, and the Jewish people lived. Genocide was averted because people who called by the name of God chose to fast and pray and put their focus on the one thing. It moves the father's heart when his children say, Abba, Father, and they cry out, and they begin to take the word of God and the relationship seriously. If you want 2020 or 2021 just to be a sequel of 2020, keep doing what you're doing. Keep listening to man's wisdom. Keep just blowing God off and just scrolling through Facebook. You find a verse that I post, you're like, well, that's pretty good. And you keep trucking, and that's your quiet time with the Lord. I'm just telling you, what you put in is what you're going to get back. But it's not because God's stingy and he doesn't love you, so quit blaming him. You put your focus on the one thing, I promise you God's going to show up. You see, there's so many examples but each monumental moment for the people of God, it all required them to simply accept the invitation that he extends, and it's this. Come and talk with me. Our response is, okay, I'm showing up. Come to the table. So here's what we're going to do. Now that I have no minutes left to actually preach the sermon, we're going to launch the One Thing Initiative. I'm going I'm I'm to need 10 more minutes, so hang tight. Um, but we're launching the One Thing Initiative, and this is going to be threaded out throughout the entire year where we're going to focus on one thing because Jesus is our only hope, guys. He's our only hope. And not only is our, our only hope, he's our future. He holds the blessings. He calls the stars by name. He's got you, and he's got me, and he's got this. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow what we see in Scripture, five-day or 21-day fast. If you have exchanged your life for the life of Jesus, I'm not going to tell you to fast, but I'm going to come right up to the line 
and say, I'm not telling you to fast, but show me in the word of God where you have a good reason why you shouldn't. That's all I'm going to say. This is very serious times. And I believe that this fast that God is calling us to as we direct our hearts back to God is very time sensitive. And I believe that there is a window that is open for the church to respond and step up because I believe that this time of fasting and prayer will not only change the course of history back to where God has intended it for it to be, but I believe that your grandchildren and your offspring are going to feel the effects of our obedience today to make this decision. We have to stop looking at ourselves and going, I'm just trying to make it Monday through Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. I've just got to handle minds. Everybody else has got, no, that is not, the, that does not how, that's not how Jesus talks. If he's our one thing, we push in all our chips and we're going, I'm focusing on my one thing. I'm going to trust in this one thing. The one thing is going to be my pursuit for 2021. We've given it to other people and other things and they've fallen short. So we're going to start fasting. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for ourselves. We're going to pray for our homes and our families and our finances and our health. Yes, but we're also going to pray for our country. We're going to pray for the church. We're going to be able to seek God because he wants to talk. He said, I want to talk, and we need to show up. So every morning, I'm sorry, every Monday night, starting tomorrow night, we're going to meet in this room, and we're going to worship, and we're going to pray, and we're going to open up the word of God from 630 to 8 o'clock. You don't have to worry about dinner because you're going to be fasting. Hey, how, how great is that, right? No? <laughs> okay. Every morning, 6.30 in the morning, for the next five days, and we may go longer, I don't know, but I'm going to meet with you on Facebook Live, and so I'm going to lead you in a devotion. We may worship. I'm going to open up the Word of God, and I'm going to disciple you through this next week. Here's what I'm asking, as humbly and as boldly as I can, in Jesus' name, please heed the invitation that's being offered today. Please heed it. At your core, this is why you came this morning because you need more from God. And I, what I'm telling you is this is the way that God has shown us in which we can experience more of him. So get your families together, leverage your influence, reach out to other Christian coworkers and family members and say, I need you to join me in this fast. But we have to get super serious about this. And now's the time to activate it. But you go, David, I, I don't understand fasting. Like, I really don't know what to do. I really don't even know what it means. Well, what we see is that in Scripture, any spiritual movement of God that we see is met with fasting and prayer first. It seems to be like the precursor. It's almost like a, re a course correction, a reset, an establishment, a foundation in which our hearts are prepared. God is opened up and free to move because we're obeying him, and he's able to step in and do the impossible, the things that only God can do. So fasting is actually a tool that's been used widely by God's people all throughout history. So when people did face impossible odds or there were doors in front of them that they couldn't open, the hand of God would come in and open those doors for them. He would do that, but it was a product of fasting and prayer, denying the flesh and saying, I'm going to pursue the one thing. I mean, we saw that basically in Daniel where we see people repenting for the sins of a nation. And I really do feel that that's part of our, that's what God is asking for us. Gee, God says, we, you know, when we post this verse, you know, if my people who are called by my name will repent and turn, right, I will heal and bless their land. We go, that's right, all those pagans out there. No, if you're called by his name, Christian, we got to repent. We got to repent of our apathy. We were asleep. That's why we want to go back to normal because we were asleep. We want to go five more minutes, Lord. Come on, I just think they got to hit that spiritual snooze button. He's like, no, it's time to, for a great awakening, and it's going to start with my church. He deal, always deals with his church first before he ever deals with the world. We need to repent. Fasting has been exercised to open doors. It could be to pray for the revival. It could be to pray for a specific person for salvation. It could be you need to fast and pray to break off the final vestiges of addiction or bondage mentally, spiritually, physically. The things that you've been dealing with, fasting accelerates this stuff. All right. So how do you fast? What is, Jesus has some stuff to say about this, and I'm going to say this super quickly. So listen fast, and I'm going to talk fast. Y'all ready? So here's the thing. Since we already know that we touch our phones 2,000 times a day, Use it for this hour right now and start taking screenshots of the slides I'm about to throw up, okay? Because you're going to need them. If you're going to step into this fast, 
start taking some pictures because Jesus said, look, if you make the decision to fast, here's a couple things. He says, when, notice this word, when you fast, Jesus says, he's not, it's, not, it's not even a question for the life of a Christian. Of course you fast. He says, when you do this, don't make it obvious like the hypocrites do for they try to look all miserable and disheveled. So here's the thing. The picture that I have in my head is, you know, you're like 22 minutes into your fast. And you post a picture of yourself looking like this on Facebook. You know, oh, I'm so hungry. I'm fasting. You know, no, 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 no. Jesus says, don't act like that. He said, because people just want to go, oh, poor baby, you fasting for Jesus. You're so holy and righteous. He's like, no, actually, the real way to do it is when you fast, Jesus says in verse 17, comb your hair, assuming you've got some, okay, and wash your face. That was a bald joke? No? Okay, cool. <laughs> verse 18. He goes on to say, and then no one will notice that you're fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. So let me explain what fasting is and what it isn't. So we're gonna talk about what it's not first. First off, it is not a simple weight loss regimen, okay? And so in the first service, I guess I made all the women mad. I was just saying, look, it's, this is not a way to go from 10, size 10 jeans to size four had the same response. Okay, got it. I, I gotta learn from my mistakes. So then I made it, I was talking about the dudes. I was like, this is not a way to go from a keg to a six pack. This is not, that's not what fasting, oh, that's funny. Oh, okay, I get it. But it's not a silver bullet to manipulate God or get our way. It's not a means to earn righteousness, by the way, either. You're already righteous, okay? What this does though, it positions you to not experience or it's, it, it doesn't get you closer to God it just helps you become so much more aware of his presence existing already does that make sense what fasting is and what it does here we go reveals the hidden motives and sins in our lives guys we all have blind spots and the Lord wants to address them so that you can walk in greater peace so you can walk and look more like Jesus okay fosters greater intimacy with God. It develops a deeper perspective and experience through power and prayer. It increases our capacity for faith. It allows us to come into greater agreement with the heart of God. It positions us to deny the flesh and attunes our ears and our hearts to hear and experience the mysteries and the will of God. This is what fasting, according to the Bible, affords a Christ follower. Look at the Ten Commandments really quickly. They came out of Moses being obedient to fast and pray for 40 days. He's invited to go up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and we see that he ate no bread, he drank no water. I, and I'm not being funny. I'm not recommending that type of fast. That's, not, that's between you and the Lord, but that's not what I'm talking about here. But this is what he was required to do. Talk about consecration. And the Lord wrote the terms of the Ten Commandments during this time. But here's the thing. Look what happens to Moses. He spends 40 days fasting and seeking the one thing. And when he comes down off the mountain, it says he wasn't even aware that every cell in his body was illuminated. So when he walked down off the mountain, his face was glowing like a flashlight. Because he had been and he had spoken to the Lord. So there's this exchange, this intimate exchange, and every cell in his body was reflecting the glory of God just because he was in his presence. Fasting and prayer. He went 40 days without eating. He went 40 days. And the reason why I bring that up is because most of us in here, our bellies are full, typically. Right? But a lot of us came in this morning, your heart is empty and you're starving. The Lord wants to feed you from his table, something that is way more beneficial than what the best bread can offer from the hands of man. You see, Jesus, before he even started his public ministry, was led into the wilderness for a time of testing and fasting. So before Jesus performed the first miracle that we see in Scripture, there's this moment in which he's baptized, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, present all at the same time. The Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness, and he begins to fast and pray for 40 days. The devil comes during this fast and says, look, God has given you a legitimate hunger for something. God made our bodies to want to eat. So why don't you just feed yourself if you're God? Make some bread. You need some carbs, Jesus. Right? But Jesus says something that I want to share with you. He goes, no, 
The scriptures actually say people don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That means that there is something way more substantial when we take the food of the Holy Spirit and the Lord gives us his daily bread. It's something more significant than just going to Mama Marge's and eating the Mike's Mexican enchilada plate. Hallelujah. As good as that is, it's not the word of God. All right. So here we go. How to fast and what to expect as we finish up. Don't get weird about it. Okay. And what I mean by that is we go, oh, oh accidentally eat a cracker. Oh no. All right. So we start getting weird. We start listen. It really isn't about what you sacrifice as much as it is why you're sacrificing it. However, when you look in scripture, you will see Daniel who only ate vegetables. Okay. Um, you see in scripture, obviously where Jesus didn't need anything for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, you also see where Paul instructs us for married couples to come to an agreed upon amount of time to abstain from having marital relations with one another, okay? So there's different ways. And so basically what you're doing is you're taking a God-given designed desire and you're going, I'm not going to feed this. Although this is a legitimate desire and, and hunger, I'm not going to feed it. So that's why it's different from saying, I'm, I'm just not going to watch HGTV for a week. I'm going to fast from the property brothers. No, that's, that's not the fast that God is really calling us to. It needs to be sacrificial, and it needs to deny a legitimate hunger that you have that God wants to bless for a time of focusing more upon him. Does that make sense? Good. Understanding that the sacrifice is simply making room for faith to grow. Fasting should always be matched with times of prayer, times of reading God's word, and worship. So if you're not doing those things, you're basically just starving for Jesus. And that's not what God is calling us to. And fasting should be fueled by expectancy. So let me just tell you from personal experience, every major decision that I've made in ministry, including the decision for God to lead us here to, to be the pastors here, has been met with prayer and fasting first. Um, this is not about a job. As a matter of fact, what I said in the first service, it's really true. I don't get paid to preach. They pay me for all the other stuff. I do this part for free because I love doing it. But the reason why I love doing it is because I know I'm called to do it here. And the Lord wants to reveal his will to you. So here's the thing. When I have fasted and prayed, most of the time I go, I don't even know if this is working. Okay? You're not going to feel very spiritual. You're going to feel hungry. You're going to be a little bit irritable. Okay? You're going to be praying. You're going to be sleepy. Oh, the, the sleepy will come and get you. The sleepy monster. And here's the thing. Just be faithful to show up and make God your one thing. That's your only job. And your only job is to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. But pepperoni pizza is talking really loud right now, so I really need you to help me to hear what you're saying. But once 21 days or your five days are done, typically in my experience, that's when you begin to see the effects of the fast. But here's the thing. Your job is not the own the results of this. Our job is to own and obey by responding to the invitation. You let God determine what he wants to show you or what he wants to do and not do. Walk in obedience, that's our job. We'll let him be the boss and decide the outcome. And I close with this. Jeremiah says, the prophet, on the behalf of God, I know the plans I have for you in 2021, Grace Point. And it's not for disaster. I'm gonna speak this over you to give you a future and a hope. In those days though, when you what? Scroll Facebook, watch TV? No, when you pray. In those days when you talk to me and you let me talk to you and I'm your one thing, you're focused on me and me alone, I will listen. So there's this moment in which God is talking and now he's going, tell me sweetheart, tell me son, what, what, do, you want to, what do you want to share with me? I'll listen to what you have to say. If you look for me wholeheartedly, he says, I will be found. I will be found. You will find me. Maybe you've been looking for God, and that's why you're watching online or you're in this room this morning, and you've been looking for God. Well, part of that, his providence is he has led you to this sermon today. And he says, this is how you're going to find me. Make me your one focus. I know, I know life has been hard. I know 2020 was a beat down and a kick in the teeth for so many of us. But he wants to be with you. He has more for you. He loves you. He says, come and 
be with me. Let's sit at the table. Let me light a candle. Let's, let's point you in the direction you need to go. 2021 does not have to suck. Only if we want to do it the world's way. But God has more for each and every one of us in here. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish up this morning? This morning, if you are seeking God as a Christ follower, this is what the Lord is calling us to. And so I'm going to invite you once again to this fast, to deny the flesh and to pursue the one thing. But maybe you're looking for God and you're like, man, I, I just, I, I, I have no hope. And I'm just, maybe this God thing, this Jesus thing, I'm, 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 I'm listening. Well, what I would tell you is that God is inviting you right now to relationship. And scripture says that Jesus paid your debt of sin so that you could exchange your sin and your debt for the forgiveness and the love of God so that you too could be invited to the table as a son and as a daughter, no longer an enemy of God. Jesus paid the price on the cross for you so that you could walk in the fullness of life because he defeated the power of hell, power of death, and the power of the grave and the power of sin. And so in this moment, if you want to have a relationship with God so that you can walk in light and hope in a dark world, pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner, but in this moment, with the faith that you have given me, I put it in you. I want to exchange my sin for your forgiveness. I want to exchange my life for your life, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead on the third day. And what I'm asking is that you would save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I make you the Lord and boss of my life. I make you my one thing. In Jesus' name. And scripture says that anybody who prays that prayer and they mean it from the bottom of their heart has just exchanged their life for the life of Jesus and has become a son or a daughter of God. As part of your a profession of faith in this room right now, if you just prayed that prayer, I'm not going to make you do anything weird, but at the count of three, if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Just put it up. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Look, look all across the room. We need to be celebrating this morning. Come on, keep your hands up. God bless you, young man. God bless you, sister. Who else in here? If you raised your hand, and if you're younger, what I'm going to ask you to do is talk to your parents, but text us at 484848 and text the word grace. And so if you're online, would you just put it in the comments and text us and let us know that you made that decision so we can celebrate and show you what it means to follow God for the rest of your life in a way that is life-giving that leads you to the Father's heart. And so Grace Point, would you stand to your feet? Thank you for allowing me to go a little bit longer today, but this is a big deal. So. We're going to actually kick off the sermon series officially next Sunday. This is just kind of a precursor of what God's put on my heart, and thank you for allowing me to share it. God is about to do something remarkable. If his people who are called by his name turn from their wicked ways, he will come and heal our land. This is the time for us to rise up and take our relationship with him seriously and step in great boldness into the things that he has in 2021. Y'all with me? All right, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. So, Lord, would you seal and bless all that you've put and purposed in this hour? And, Lord, we thank you for the things that you have invited us into. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. May you be our one thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all be good. Have a good week. We'll see you next week.